Junior played baseball at school, but he wasn't the star on the team. He was good at his schoolwork, but he wasn't the, the, the smart person in the class. He was just average. So there was nothing that stood out. There was nothing that said that this family would be the family that would produce a serial killer. To the outside world, the Yates's were a happy, contented, all-American family. In many ways, Yates's relationship with his father was completely normal. Usually it's thought that even one positive role model is sufficient to stop people from becoming seriously psychiatrically disturbed, and yet it didn't do anything here. We have to ask ourselves the question, why? When investigators dug into Yates' family history, they discovered something shocking. We learned that his grandmother killed his grandfather, and there was some violence in the family, obviously. Uh, his grandmother didn't just kill his grandfather, but she killed him in a especially gruesome way. She took an ax to him, actually. And then was committed to a mental institution. And that becomes, I suspect, an intergenerational message, which is women are very dangerous. They have what you want, but they're very dangerous people. While there was a violent history in the family, Yates himself allegedly suffered some trauma when he was just six years old. We often find in serial killers that that violence is actually rooted in shame. That shame is often something that has happened during the childhood, something that the child felt they had no control over, but something that they felt judged by, something that, that made them feel less worthy. Robert Lee Yates was sexually assaulted by another child who was a neighbor. But Yates kept the assault a secret. The incident was never reported to police. After graduating high school, Yates met his first wife. In 1972, age 20, Yates and his wife moved to the small town of Walla Walla in Washington State, where they enrolled in college. There, he spent his free time alone in the woods, hunting, hiking, and fishing. The parents of his wife, years later, say actually he was quite a loner. We never really got to know him. Even though he was married to their daughter, he was somebody who was quite insular. And it's that constant theme of invisibility. Yates's marriage to his first wife ended in divorce just 18 months later. However, he had already begun a new relationship with another woman. In December that year, Yates got a job at the Washington State Penitentiary, and the first of their five children was born. It wouldn't surprise me if he'd been fantasizing about this for quite some time. And he comes across two college graduates, and he decides that he's going to kill them. And that's what he does. He literally shoots them in cold blood. A rage burst out. He acted entirely instinctively and shot them both. It is unimaginable. Why would you do that? There is something profoundly out of kilter in Yates's personality. For Yates, simply murdering the young friends was not enough. He placed the body of Susan on top of that of Patrick. And Susan's body, he'd removed a lot of her clothing. So this is really humiliating. This is really demeaning. Yates left the bodies by the side of the creek and covered them with a pile of rubbish, a sleeping bag, and an old tire. Yates essentially assassinates them. And what his motivation was is, I mean, it's anyone's guess. Yates's flying career was quickly put on hold as his medical results were being processed. He's grounded, he's not allowed to fly his helicopter. Now, this is a pivotal moment for me because somebody else has taken control, somebody else has made that decision. He's not the one that's in the driving seat anymore. Despite not initially being able to fly, he remains in the National Guard. But with a large family to support, he takes on a menial job at a manufacturing plant in Spokane. And all the while, Yates continued to kill. I think the murders that he committed were an attempt to get back control. I think there were things happening in his life that he felt were out of his control, and he wanted to feel powerful again. His new hunting ground was the seedy strip in downtown Spokane, known as The Track. Prostitutes to Yates were easy targets in that they would get into his vehicle without any questions asked. They would just 
decide about what money was going to be exchanged for services. And the prostitutes were very vulnerable because most of them were drug addicts and they'd sell themselves for money and use it to buy drugs. Robert Lee Yates was very much a regular face on the, the sex workers scene in, in this part of town at the time. So he wouldn't just pick up women to have sex with, he would do drugs with them. He became part of their community. And I think he would be trusted by them. He was somebody that they knew. In the summer of 1997, Yates picked up 20-year-old Heather from the downtown track to have sex with her. But I suspect that the victims may not have known even the second before they died that this was going to be a killing. Because I suspect their interaction went down much as an interaction with a prostitute goes down. And then when he was done, he draws his gun and he shoots. Yates shot Heather in the head with a 22 caliber handgun. Literally, there's just a second that the victim becomes aware that something's amiss, and after that, the victim is dead. After Yates murdered Heather, he dumped her body on the side of the road. Well, he was brazen in his thought as far as dumping the bodies. In August that year, Yates was back on the track looking for easy prey. He picked up 16-year-old Jennifer. Like the young woman before her, her fate was a foregone conclusion. Unlike many serial killers, the way that Yates kills is instrumental. He has sex with his victims, and then he pulls out a gun and he shoots them. They die virtually instantaneously at the hand of somebody who knows how to use weapons effectively. He's not trying to torture. He's not trying to terrorize. He's simply eliminating the witness. He watches as the life literally drains from them. And this is an individual who's is not going to stop because his offending is getting worse. It's becoming more sadistic. Once dead, Yates prepared to move Jennifer's body, a ritual he would repeat time and time again. After shooting them in the heads, he put bags over their head, largely uh, to keep his car clean. I mean, he didn't want the blood dri dripping out and would put plastic bags over their heads to to keep the mess off his car. Ten days later, local farmers found Jennifer's badly decomposed body. It had been dumped in brush northeast of Spokane. This site where Jennifer was found, it was next to a working farm near to a, an alfalfa field. Investigators also found a number of bloodstains. When tested, they revealed DNA belonging to Jennifer. They knew that her murder had been in that vehicle before she'd been dumped in a field northwest of Spokane. All of the evidence is starting to match up, and it leads them right back to Robert Lee Yates. The task force put in a warrant for Yates's arrest. By the time the detectives get a warrant for his arrest, they are 100% certain they've got the right man. On April the 17th of 2000, the task force put Yates under 24-hour surveillance. The police had staked out the family home, um, made sure that he was there, and after he left for work uh, at 6 o'clock the, the following morning, they moved in and they arrested him. The same day, detectives searched Yates's house for further evidence. Immediately after his arrest, a sample of Yates's DNA was taken and compared with samples collected from a number of murder victims found between 1996 and 1998. It was tested that day and came back late that afternoon. I recall that we were at the Yates home conducting a search when we got word that the DNA matched Robert Yates. At least eight of the victims had the same DNA found on them, so we knew we were dealing with a serial killer. All the investigators were very happy. We were actually elated. The day after Yates was apprehended, a newspaper report was released detailing his arrest. Upon seeing it, former sex worker Christine Smith instantly recognized Yates as being the man who shot her in the back of his van in August of 1998. At the time of the incident, she thought she'd been stabbed and had reported it to police. 
it wasn't until uh, a couple of years later when she was involved in a car wreck that she went to the hospital and they discovered shrapnel in her head and then she realizes that she's actually been shot she hasn't been stabbed somebody has held a gun to her head and pulled the trigger and not only that this person who's done this is Robert Lee Yates, and she realizes I could have been one of his victims. Christine's evidence helped connect the final pieces of the puzzle. Her coming forward was very crucial to the task force. She came forward, provided the information to law enforcement, and she was a, a living victim, if you will. It's a living person that could testify against Robert Yates. A month later, in May of 2000, investigators meticulously searched Yates's black van. They discovered blood pertaining to two other victims, three bullet holes and spent bullets and bullet debris containing Christine's DNA. When the task force finally got to her, they had the bullet fragment surgically removed and it ballistically matched up to the same weapon that was used in some of these other killings. While searching Yates's property, investigators discovered the murder weapons. He used handguns. Some of the victims may also have been killed with a 22, but most of the murders were committed by a 25 caliber handgun. The task force now had enough evidence to charge him with a total of 13 murders and the attempted murder of Christine Smith. In October of 2000 at the Spokane Superior Court, Yates faced his charges. In front of a packed room, the serial killer took to the stand and made a shock plea. Yates, to the surprise of many, goes to court and pleads guilty to 13 counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. The callous killer avoided going to trial by pleading guilty to the murders.